I get my hair cut tomorrow, so this is bad timing. My hair's all messed up. But oh, it looks good. I like it when it's got little curlies in the front. You know it, baby. <laughs> all right. So many of you might remember that over the pandemic, um, a instruction assessment all shifted uh, to some sort of hybrid virtual online thing and institutions were really scrambling for how to assess how to evaluate how to grade kids remotely um and we had pointed out at the time in a lot of the work that we did that we should err on the side of um modifying assessments evaluation modifying instruction in a more human centered direction instead of cracking down on these su- surveillance uh, these surveillance tools and software. And one of the things that came up and, and Chris and I had watched this video back in 2000 or 2000, geez, in 2020, when it came out, um, was this video from that one Mohammed on how to cheat on an online proctored exam. And I think at the time, the tool that a lot of, uh, uh, professors and educators were using was Proctorio. And it was a tool that at like read your, um, eye line. So if you were looking off to the side, um, you know, it tracked where things were in your room. You had to like pick your laptop up or your phone up and and give it a look around the room to make sure there wasn't anyone in there. And students really found it intrusive. This is the report that you get from Proctorio for students. Oh, OK. The way Proctorio and other softwares like it work is they turn your webcam on. So you have to have a webcam on while you're taking a test. It records your screen and looks at you. And it's monitoring for these different things. And then we'll put you either in the green, yellow, or red, depending on if you're, if you're doing um, these different things. So it's trying to make sure that you're not alt tabbing to different resources, which there's been a lot of lockdown browsers that have prevented you from doing that or copying and pasting. But it also does, I think it takes it even a step further to a point where it feels very intrusive. Uh, it detects your head movements, how you move your head around your eye line, as you were just saying, if there's multiple people in the picture, if you leave the room and it's been, it's been criticized from the point of a systemic thing of, well, why are we making tests in the first place that are this high stakes that would be focused on not using outside resources or would force you to memorize or, or would need this system to exist in the first place. But it's also been criticized from a purely logistical angle because of how it's, it's ableist, it, the way at which folks learn and, and act and behave is not always this neurotypical lens at which Proctorio is designing its software, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. So like if I'm, if I'm just going like this in the middle of my exam, you know, that's not me making eye contact with the, with the camera, but that's just me thinking, right? I'm like, oh, what's the next thing? But I could get rated it kind of in the yellow or the red zone for, you know, am I looking at materials off screen or doing something else? And of course, it dings people who are in multifamily environments who don't have a, you know, nice designated space like this. So maybe you have a, my kids are always coming in. Chris can vouch for this. My kids are always coming into the picture from, from off screen to ask me something. Really quickly, it's worth noting that's not just the, the stimming element or, the neurodiversity element of this. It's also race. Um, Mm. I I referenced it in, I think, two or three other videos now, but Meredith Broussard's book, uh, More Than a Glitch, that talks about AI and tech bias, brings this up. And I'm pretty sure she mentioned specifically Proctorio, or at least uh, one of the surveillance softwares. And the facial detection tools don't do well with non-white skin tones. So the the non-white skin tones like are just not programmed into the software because as you would expect, the vast majority of people programming these are white men. So there's an actual level of systemic racism that's baked into the technology itself. Um, it says here's a report. This is the University of Illinois dropping Proctorio. In addition to many other things, non-white students have reported that facial detection software struggles to recognize their skin tone and students with head scarves sometimes get flagged. Students need sufficient network bandwidth and a webcam for it to work. They also have a quiet space, as you were just getting at before. It's it's uh it's problematic to say the least. Yeah. So, what, so what's this video? What, yeah. So what I was getting at is it really launched an arms race with uh, with students trying to overcome, trying to hack, not like in a nefarious way, right? But like um like, like this one says from that one Muhammad. Chris and I watched this in 2020 when it first came out. 
Uh, and now it's titled How to Cheat on an Online Proctored Exam 2023. Chris, how many views does this have? 1.1 million views. <laughs> Perfect. If you can get a normal piece of paper like you would print and cut that in half and just write down your notes small, but not too small, large enough that you can read them. And this will definitely help you with your examination. And what you want to do is place this right above your keyboard on your laptop and on the very below part of the screen, if that makes sense. Yeah. This is a blind spot where your webcam cannot pick up. And my advice is you can even print out a Perfect. sheet and just actually cut it in half after you've typed in like your... It's just gaming the system. Something that people were doing in person for, for exams for decades. Um, this is something right. that happened, right? I, I remember in high school, my friends and classmates writing on paper and then putting it around a plastic water bottle. And then, you know, if, if that was sitting on the floor, then you could look down and see it there. And then, of course, the, the, the old trope is just writing it on the inside of your hand or, my God, how many of us had the TI-80 calculators? And then you could slip some paper in there or, or, and slide it out or just program in your TI-80. Like the, you could write up your notes in there and then just pull it up at the last minute and put all the formulas in there. Oh my gosh, we found ingenious ways of cheating. What we're trying to say is not that cheating is okay, but that it's a systemic problem that we're still giving assessments like this, let alone 20 years ago, 30 years ago when the internet existed and our access to information changed and the way that we work with information changes, let alone now when we have even more tools at our disposal why is it that we're still focusing on rote memorization as a primary means of assessment as opposed to something more authentic the most frustrating part of this to me is that college in theory is supposed to be this space for high academic achievement it's for people that really want to push the boundaries of very specific um, field that they want to go into and or st and study. The vast majority of college classes consist of you feeding your, you know, your rote memor mem It's you feeding your mo ro God, Jesus Christ, I'm breaking. <laughs> you feeding your rote memorized content knowledge into this digital space, receiving some points back and then moving on with your life. So we wanted to bring in to contextualize this, a story from, I believe that this was the summer, which is at Texas A&M. The same week the CEO of OpenAI warned of the dangers of artificial intelligence. I think if this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong. Uh, and we want to be vocal about that. We want to work with the government to prevent that from happening. A controversy is brewing over ChatGPT at a college in Texas. A professor at Texas A&M University Commerce is on blast for accusing his students of using ChatGPT on their final assignments. But here's the thing, many of those students did not use ChatGPT, according to the university. The firestorm started when Jared Mum, an instructor in the Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources Department, sent his students this email, which went viral on Reddit. The email reads, quote, I have opened my own account for ChatGPT. I copy and paste your responses into this account, and ChatGPT will tell me if the program generated this content. He goes on to say that he tested oh, each paper and that the bot claimed to have written every single final assignment. The number one lesson that professors need to learn from this is that ChatGPT is not oh, there yet. Collins. The end of the story is basically this guy failed his entire class because he thought it was AI generated. He thought yeah. all of the responses were AI all generated. Now, just, yes, every right, just single think thing. about like, yeah. if, if I got that result back, it would raise red flags to me on the chat GPT front. Like I would think there is just no way that I got that it got that many hits, right? We were kind of brought attention to this by uh, a, a person on our Discord, Crazy Cat Jen. So thanks, Crazy Cat Jen. Uh, Crazy Cat Jen brought to our attention this story um, that is on Ed Week, but it's referencing this report, which we're not gonna we're not gonna read a whole other report like we did in our last video. It was really quick to summarize. It's a report saying ostensibly the blocking and assumption of AI as bad is harming students. And the monitoring of students is leading to this mass distrust of kids. And what's mm. happening is a lot of kids are reporting that their teacher is going on one of these content detector websites, which I have open on the screen here, 
copying and pasting their essays in and then accusing them of cheating or using AI to help their paper or whatever it might be. And that's it's leading to a, like a relationship breakdown. If you even just go on to our website, like our HRP website, I'm just going to pull up. This is a paper that I wrote. I know I didn't use AI on this paper because it wouldn't honestly have been able to write it. Um, it's too weird of a take. But if I just take a random piece of this, so I'm going to copy and paste. If it was this text written by human or AI, here's that thing. Check origin. So it says, there's a 49% probability this text was entirely written by AI. So we got about a 50-50 shot that the thing I just copied and pasted that I wrote is not real. It's important to note this website says down here like, hey, you shouldn't use this to punish students. But what we're finding by browsing Why else would you uh, use TikTok it? and Reddit and some other spaces is this is being used to punish students. Because what's happening is teachers are calling kids up and not necessarily from a nefarious angle, or I would say it's a judgmental angle to asking kids like, hey, did AI write this? Because it's, it seems like potentially it did. And even if that's well-intentioned, if you were to approach me and say, Chris, did you have AI write this entire article that you just published? I would be offended by that. Saying like implying that I cheated when you told me not to do that is it's offensive. Or maybe you should be honored because it means that you have the uh, <laughs> the pros of a learned machine. You know, you can just generate uh, text that sounds just as smart as Google. It doesn't mean that we should allow kids to cheat or that we shouldn't be conscientious if kids are cheating. But there's a difference between making a judgment call versus talking more broadly with students about uh, cheating and plagiarism. And exactly as we brought up in that Heim Gannat video that. You don't just call a kid out for cheating. You talk about cheating broadly. And then if someone cheats and you address it directly after you catch them doing it in the moment. Right. Um, but we need to have more nuanced conversations about this as opposed to just like reprimanding them. When the New York Public School District blocked access to the popular artificial intelligence tool chat GPT earlier this month, it was the latest response to concerns over how rapidly changing technology is affecting our lives. Educators worry that students are using this technology to write papers and that they'll never have to learn how to write on their own. The tool wasn't even a month old when a college professor caught a student using it to write an essay for her philosophy class. Darren Hick of Furman University wrote about that on his Facebook page, and he's with us now for our periodic series, The AI Frontier. I feel like we're asking the wrong questions or have the wrong concerns. If you look back at the paper that this kid is writing, it's on game theory in World War II. That's not an essay. That is a definition, right? It's not an opinion. It's not a nuanced take. It's not anything that's interesting. If I type in game theory, World War II, like I can already find that information. It's just summarizing something that already existed. What is going on above the uh, a code creating a basic web page with an image of a golden retriever? <laughs> yeah, and of course, Chris, it's what you're getting at, right? Which is, write a 600-word essay on game theory in World War II. That essay has already been written. There's, what else do you need to write about that? <laughs> Unless you're doing original research for it. Um, why can't we have, here is the thing that ChatGPT probably won't do, is that if you have students um, use a number of resources or citations for various uh, resources, primary, secondary, whatever. Um, I don't know if ChatGPT is going to do as good a job of that, or if it's just about re repetition and repeating the content, then yeah, that's going to be something that ChatGPT is going to do very well. So why would we assess that? I mean, with some of the plugins and stuff, you can get it to do citations and it might surpass our ability to also give citations on a paper. It's it's treating the system at which it's trying to work itself in wrong. Like if you think about how you're typically assigned papers in college, it's you go through eight to 12 weeks of a class and then there's a final paper and you turn that paper in, you get a grade on it and that's the end of the conversation. So the purpose of the paper isn't to see if you're a good writer. It's just another way of doing a quiz. It's trying to see if you have all the factual information correct 
the purpose of a paper could be to help you become a better writer. If that's the case, then you need to create a classroom environment at which you're communicating with kids. Hey, this is about making you a better writer. We're not going to use ChatGPT. Here's why we're going to do things in class. We're going to break it down. If the audience for the work was not just between you and, you know, clicking submit on an LMS or just sending it, turning it into your professor or whatever, then that changes the dynamic too. Because if I'm going to be presenting something to an audience and perhaps they're going to be asking me questions, I'm going to have to know in my own words, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to be able to rely on what chat GPT tells me because then I'm not going to be prepared in the moment to be able to respond to audience Q and a, or can I talk about it in a presentation? We've all sat through those student presentations <laughs> that are just big blocks yeah. of text read off of it without a lot of comprehension. Well, in a perfect world, those those presentations will be purposeful. So kids want to learn that information and actually want to maintain it. And there's a there's right. a big a cog, there's a bit of cognitive dissonance here because there is a space for rote memorization. Like there are certain things when I taught digital design, we we always run through a bunch of design techniques. So white space repetition, these concepts that you look for in every design. And we memorize those things. We did a bunch of quizzes. We did a bunch of kind of repetitious games and flashcard review to ensure that we knew those eight to 12 different terms. And mm -hmm. the reason why we did that is that it has to be readily accessible. It's not something that you would just Google. It's something that you're constantly looking for and referencing over and over again in the exact same way that you wouldn't want, you know, your doctor to be entirely trained on everything through chat GPT and Googling it. They need to have some fundamental knowledge of making that work. But that only applies when you're working with purposeful, hands-on, intentional content. As you were reading this essay, what were the red flags that this might have been uh, other than her own product? There's several red flags that come up in, a, in any case of plagiarism. They just sort of build up until you have to screech the grading to a halt and look into the problem. In this case, it got some basic uh, issues exactly right. Other things fundamentally wrong. It talked about things that the student wouldn't have learned about in class, which is always something of a flag, and connected things together in a way that was just thoroughly wrong, but it was, it was beautifully written. Well, um, beautifully for a, a college uh, take-home exam anyway. So it was a weird collection of flags. I really resent how suspicious these technologies can make professors educators generally in particular, of students, right? The presumption is always going to be that you have cheated until proven somehow otherwise. Uh, because, again, I think a lot of professors, perhaps, a lot of ed K-12 educators, too, they believe in the hype of AI and chat GPT um, more than is warranted, right? So they think it's kind of this catch-all magic box. It can do everything. They're always going to be on the lookout for the ways that that uh, they can catch students in the act of using it. Right. I want to be in a scenario where I don't even need to be presented with the choice of feeling this way. Like I want to remove yes. myself from a system entirely where I would even need to guess whether or not a student is using chat GPT to cheat on an assignment because it wouldn't be yes. not only plausible, but it also wouldn't be a problem. Like if they use chat GPT, we would have an open enough relationship that they could just tell me, yeah, I use chat GPT on this part because the goal is learning, not high stakes assessment that's going to like determine if they pass or fail a course. So when I caught the student using it, it was maybe three weeks old at that point, not even. And it was an infant. But a month from now, it's going to be better. A year from now, it's going to be better. Five years from now, the genie's out of the bottle. So my worry is mostly about how do we keep up with this thing? How do we prepare for this thing? Plagiarism isn't anything new. I don't expect a new flood of plagiarists, but in that cost-benefit analysis that I was talking about, this changes the analysis for students. This is a tool that makes things easier, faster. And so my worry is that we'll get more students who are using this method, and we need to be prepared for that coming. I just want to pull out what he just said, which is, well, the problem is, is that education is all about efficiency and getting ahead and doing things quicker and faster. We've developed an entire system of education that is centered around you go through X amount of time, produce X amount of assignments, and then you move on. 
It's just about how quickly can I get through my studying to pass the test to get on to the next step without ever slowing down and actually caring about learning about something. The vast majority of classes are completely irrelevant because there's no purpose behind them. And I was just going to say, if we took that clip in isolation, minus the references to chat GPT, he could be talking about the internet. He could be talking about Wikipedia. He could be talking about graphing calculators. He could literally be talking about any introduction of new technology. Of course, right? This is going to, you know, augment and change things. But just as, as you've said for months now, Chris, like, so too did those other technologies, right? And somehow, you know, the edu education man... Kids still managed to learn and pass classes. So I, I wanted to also pull in this video as well. So this to me is the updated version of that video we kicked off with. So that video we kicked off with was about Proctorio. This video right. is, well, how do I get past AI detection? What he does is he takes whatever chat GPT writes and then he puts it into this website called Paraphraser. And you can see it takes it and rewrites it. And he like turns up the number of synonyms, et cetera. He then puts it into one of these detector softwares and you can see it says it's 100% original because, and I say this again, not because I think that this isn't a problem that kids are cheating and they, it's the fact that they feel like they need to cheat <laughs> to begin with. Um, so here's like the original, it's 100% AI. You can see once he ran through the paraphraser, it turns into being 100% um, original. So it's a, it's a losing yeah. battle. If our goal is to fight this battle of, well, we're going to make sure kids don't cheat because we're going to run it through detection softwares, they're not going to work. If you read enough chat GPT generated stuff, it kind of has a syntax. I don't know how these AI detectors work. Um, I, I'm willing to bet that the amount of false positives is very high, um, mm -hmm. but it, it, it's incredibly ironic and hilarious that it just launders chat GPT through a different AI tool to create tools that are uh, recorded as one being 100% human generator, 100% original. So clearly th this is just trained on say chat GPT as opposed to any other AI large language model. It's an arms race that I feel like should speed up the advent of systemic yeah. change toward a more human centered education, as opposed right. to something that we're inevitably going to lose, which is doubling down on these traditional forms of assessment and learning. Um, that said, obviously this is shocking for the 80 to 90 percent of people who do run their classes in more traditional ways and shifting away from that is going to be difficult it's not just a, a you know a snap of the finger and all of a sudden we have an entirely new system of education that's able to address this it takes training and professional development of which you can learn more about on our website because that's what we do with schools i mean we we offer workshops on this kind of thing because teachers need the proper training and pedagogical knowledge to think about it in this way. Um, I did want to bring in this video as well, because I thought it was a really interesting <laughs> counter perspective to the last teacher. This is a TikTok. This is from law, like lore, lore in order. Um, her nickname is the the cool professor. Welcome to the world of AI detection, where Turnitin is now detecting real work is AI. Hi, I'm Miss Lawson, I'm a biology instructor, and I'm here to tell you how you can avoid this. Keep track of everything you do with your essay. Keep an outline, keep your notes, keep your rough drafts. If you can write in something like Google Pages, which tracks when you made edits, this way if something pops up as AI, you can pull up that and say, hey, I wrote the first sentence at this time, I wrote that second paragraph then, I did this then. All of this was input by me. Because here's the deal. AI detection is based on patterns and predictions. It is not 100% accurate, and Turnitin will tell you this. But there are professors out there who 100% believe Turnitin. They don't want to hear out students, they're just going to give you a zero because Turnitin says it was AI. You as the student need to keep this proof that you did your own work. So if you run into a situation like this, you can fight it. If someone accuses you of AI and you have no proof that you wrote the essay, your side isn't looking good, even if you didn't use AI. And it really sucks. My biggest recommendation for you is just to keep up with your records. Yeah, she rocks, man. That's great. Well, and it makes sense, too, because Google Docs even just has like a track changes. You can look, see all the comments and when they've been resolved. You can go back through all those things. So, yeah, if over the course of your essay, you're getting feedback, incorporating it, leaving yourself little notes, making changes, Google will track that. Um, it's a problem of 
having, you know, in the moment, if you're like on on demand kind of essays, um, that's a little bit of a different thing because you're writing it over the course of like 40 minutes um, in a win in a separate window somewhere where you can't access that. I also worry about the reductionist nature of the argument through both professors and teachers, because mm -hmm. the end result of this also could be that kids who don't want to get in trouble, who are afraid of cheating, never actually see the benefits of using ChatGPT and other models to improve mm -hmm. on their writing. So coming back to this, uh, I, I don't know, this report from the Center for Democracy and Technology, what I right. think is really interesting is how school policies may even be out of step or even just too far ahead of where parents even are at with this, you know, in the middle in the middle of this where it says um, cameras with facial recognition technology used to detect student emotion. Twenty three percent of teachers reported use of technology, but that ranks pretty high in terms of student and parent concerns on that as well. Um, schools monitoring what students post publicly on their personal social media accounts. Teachers report 37 percent. That's also a huge concern for students and parents. So it seems like schools are already in some ways rolling out technologies that um, have haven't really been part of the conversation yet. Uh, and that that kind of seems problematic. It's worth noting that in the vast majority of these, most kids and most parents are concerned about these technologies being integrated in schools. And they're all for the most part, they're all anti-student. Digital hall passes, yeah. um, school monitoring, remote proctoring software, AI facial recognition, your data being shared with law enforcement. Um, and then going down to this page, in terms of content blocking, again, just getting into this argument of proactive versus reactive. Should we block things versus should we allow things? There are certain things that obviously most people um, think we should block um, like pornography, which is very funny that 78% yeah. of students and 80% of parents think that that should be blocked. So I guess there's some <laughs> the very, uh, very, some uh, of the students are like, what's, what's yeah. the, what's the line for my thing you should leave? I'm not in trouble at all. No, we should be able to uh, look at a little porn at work. <laughs> Uh, so that's a little. The two percent you know, is Tim Robinson, right there. That's, that's a little intense. But then, like, you go down here and like sites that help students cheat. It, only forty-one percent of students think that you should block that uh, content showing or describing violence. So, content about school shooting, street violence, or bullying. Oh, only forty-one percent of students using Chat GPT. Thirty-one percent of students and thirty-seven percent of parents think that should be blocked. It's relatively low. This is earlier in the report where they're talking about. Um, like LGBTQIA resources. Look at that. I mean, it's almost one in five say that that it's that it is blocked um, because that's becoming more and more prevalent. And obviously, the vast majority of students do not think that should be blocked. All this matters because we're always having to adapt to new technologies. And any time where it causes us to treat students with more suspicion rather than um, respond to them with more humanity, probably puts us on the back foot and puts education uh, at a disadvantage relative to technological changes. And if you need assistance with talking about generative AI with a critical nuance lens, that's not just like all in or all out, but it helps your school adopt to it, we'll come work with you. So contact us. Hey, thanks for watching. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and, um, Drop in the comments what percentage of your schoolwork you put on ChatGPT.